discussing the uh, what it means to be an heir, and uh, <clears throat> won't you turn with me to Luke, Gospel of Luke, chapter ten? Is this uh, first class helping anybody? Good. <clears throat> All right, Luke ten. And uh, verse 25, uh, we won't read this whole thing. I'll just read uh, verse 25 because I'm, we're going to go into another location in Luke. By the way, as we proceed, uh, you may notice my little shiny button given to me by Amber Allen for uh, St. Patrick's Day tomorrow. All right. <clears throat> It says, uh, is it today? Oh, that's why I'm wearing green. And you're not. All right. Luke 10, 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now turn with me to Luke 18, verse 18. Luke 18, 18. And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Apparently, among religious people, there is a thought that you can do something to inherit. Okay? Okay? you can do something to inherit. Now, we know that there is an inheritance that isn't financial. Amen? That in a family, for example, my mother had real light blue eyes. Okay? And when I was born, I inherited her eyes. And then my firstborn daughter, she was born with real light blue eyes. She inherited my eyes that I inherited from my mother. And her second son also had real light blue eyes. He inherited those from his mom who inherited them from me who inherited them from my mom. <clears throat> and there are basic traits that a family has that you inherit these traits. Is that right or wrong? <clears throat> and so... It would be like walking up to Jesus and seeing all of these good traits, these spiritual traits, these wonderful traits of nature and traits of, of uh, how he bears himself and saying to him, good master, what must I do to inherit those, that stuff? And he would say, well, you've you got to be in the family. Right? you got to be in the family. Now, let's get real. What most people say being in the family is, is joining the club. Am I right or wrong? That really is. I mean, it really, they join the club. They join the family club. You know? Um, you know, there are, there are clubs, whether it's Christian or not, that you can join, and they will call you being part of the family. But you're not part of the family at all. You're part of the club. And the proof that you're not part of the family is that you're not inheriting the family traits. Okay? And this is why to be born again is a genuine change out from you. You're, for example, we said you could inherit your family traits. Well, you know, within my family is, uh, let's see, Probably murder. I don't know that for sure, but I got a feeling. <laughs> I get that from things that rise in me from time to time. But, uh, um, you know, um, depression, um, all sorts of stuff, you know. And you can be bound by that. Or you can be free. But, but how do you become free 
from your family traits. How do you, how, let's put it this way, how do you not inherit the traits of your family? How do you get out of that inheritance that you have inherited from them? The only answer is to die and to be reborn into a family that has different traits. All right, now consider you. Is there anything about you that you don't like that you've seen in your mother or you've seen in your father? And I know, Amber, I know you've seen a lot of stuff in your dad and mom, but we're not going to talk about all that right now. But is there anything that you've seen that you go, well, I wish I didn't have this? Well, I think that would be true of everybody. The answer is to inherit from another family. The answer is, there has to be the death of the first and a new birth. There has to be. Now, all of us believe that we've been born again. But the proof of, the proof of believing into that, not believing that, remember what we talked about last session? Not believing that as a fact that I've been born again. No, believing into that fact is that I am no longer an individual based on my own life, nor do I relate to Christianity based on my life. I don't even relate to Christianity. I relate to Christ. I relate to Christ. And I'm related to Him by being in Him, or I'm related to Him by being joined to Him, or I'm a joined heir. What, what I've inherited, I've inherited by being joined. Amen? I mean, that's what I... That's where I get what I get. <laughs> Praise God. <clears throat> All right, so your, your hope is, you know, I just for, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I'll show you this, what I just said. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. And it says this. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. If it's a bad, corrupt tree, there is no way that it can inherit incorruption. For example, if there's a bad tree, say I'm the bad tree, and there's a good tree over here, and that's Jesus, and, and my roots and the life flowing within me is corrupt, there is nothing I can do to inherit the incorruption that is there by doing something. What must I do to inherit? Nothing. You can do to do this or that, but you can't do to inherit. The only possible way to bear that kind of fruit, let me say it again, the only possible way to bear that kind of fruit is you have to be grafted in. You have to be. It has to be a real thing, not a doctrine. It must be a life transforming thing. So, uh, the scripture you're well familiar with, but in this context it might actually sound good to you or different or better or something. John 15 verse 4. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except you abide in me. Does that make a little more sense now? That the branch inherits traits of the tree that is grafted into, that it's grafted into. So he's saying, abide in me, and what I have will come forth out of you. Okay. That means... That, and let me try to do this. That means that there has to be a cutting out before there can be a grafting in. Amen? There has to be, and that's what the cross means. It is not a historical event. It is not a secret power. 
you know, like uh, in these old movies or new movies where the vampire or something evil comes and you hold up a cross and it runs it off. Folks, it's not a secret power. The power is that it actually puts you to death. To death. There is an actual death and there is an actual resurrection. Okay? So the death is a grafting. It is a cutting you out of your life source. Where you are no longer related in understanding and in viewpoint. Your understanding has become one of the cross. Your comprehension now is in relationship to death. What I was is never going to be counseled out of me. I can't talk it out of me. I can't rearrange it. I can't improve it. The best thing I can do is die to it. I die unto it. That's, a, that's not an ethereal thing. That's a grafting that when you don't see it in you, you see it by the spirit of revelation. Did you hear what I just said? This is not something you see in you first and then affirm it. You don't see death in you and then affirm it. Your faith is not in you. This is not about moments of affirmation concerning you. This is about affirming that you were cut out of the old and you died to the old and have become now a vessel of the new, which is the new man, which is the son, the, the risen son. The risen son that you are in. But I don't want to draw you individually in there because it could be like placing that old picnic table in here and there be no union, just a change of location. This is a genuine joining to, but it, but it will have no power until there is a comprehension of the grafting of the death. Uh, the grafting meaning the cutting out of first before the joining into. So you're not a table that's going to be placed in a room and transformed. The table will remain what it is. You are a branch that has been taken out of the old, that has been used to bearing the old, and is being transformed on the inside by the life and nature of something that you're joined to. Corruption will never inherit in corruption. Okay? Why? Because corruption inherits corruption. Does this make sense? And it just, it, it'll, you know, this, this tree that's corrupt, this seed that comes out of it will end up being corrupt like it, and on and on and on and on. It will be a constant process of, of continuing or the continuation of corruption. No matter how much prayer, no matter how many fowls of the air you cast out of that tree, you with me? You're not going to change the basic problem. You know, this is just a fact. Bugs and worms and all that stuff gravitate towards trees that are already sick. Did you know that? For the most part, that's true. I mean, when it's, already, when it's struggling, having a hard time, it, that gets, it gets this infestation and stuff. That's not totally true across the board. Bugs go everywhere and all that. But I'm just telling you that for the most part, uh, uh, they will spot, you know, the fowls of the air and everything else will spot a problem and then they gravitate to that. You say, oh my God, oh my God. Well, there's an answer. 
There's an answer. There has to be the cross. There has the death. You are the death. He is the resurrection. I keep trying to brand that in your mind. You're the death. You're dead. When you, we talk about death, we're talking about you. When we're talking about resurrection, we're talking about Him. We're not talking about events. <laughs> you know? We're not talking about... That's what, that's what confused Martha and Mary trying to talk to Jesus about resurrection. He, he was talking about a person and they were talking about an event. It always confuses people. So you have to get that into you. All right. So the branch will always inherit. Uh, there's a, I have a scripture actually that helps to show that. So you'll know that. I, I quoted that, but I want you to know that it comes from the Word of God. Romans 11. Romans 11 and verse 16 and 17 says, For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. Whoa! If the root be holy, so are the branches. What will the branches inherit? Well, let's keep reading. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou be in a wild olive branch, wert grafted in among them, and with them partakers of the root and fatness of the olive tree. We, as a branch, are partakers of the root and the fatness that we're grafted into. We inherit what we're grafted into or what we're joined to. Okay? Who do? And I'm not talking about, you know, you go down here on the street and you hang out with some guys and they're talking street junk and, you know, you like hanging out with them for, you know, 20 minutes a day that that's going to... I, I'm talking on a deeper level than that. I'm talking on a core level of who you are. You're either in Adam or you're in Christ. You're either you or you're Him. That's what I'm talking about. All right. So turn with me to... Uh, Book of uh, Colossians, chapter two. Let's just begin to look at this in terms of uh, in terms of uh, the scriptures. How the how scriptures that we might not have really looked at them like this, we can look at them now. Okay. Colossians two, and let's read verse nine and ten. For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power. Alright. You could say, like a branch to the vine, you are complete in Him. Does that help anybody? You can read you're complete in Him until you're blue in the face and not be complete. Isn't that right? I mean, that's ridiculous. We, we're believing at stuff again. We're believing, you know, at it. We're not believing into it. There is a believing into that changes things. And, and I can hold a doctrine out here and look at it and believe it and not believe into it. And I'm still lacking in fullness. And one of the neat things about this word complete here is that in reality it actually is the same word as in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead. It really is the word fullness. So listen carefully. For in him, in him, and those who are joined into him, for in him, or, or let's just say in him, even if you're joined or not, this guy is the fountainhead of all flow. Okay? Let's just say, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In bodily form is really the, the original right there. In bodily form. In him is all the fullness of the whole Godhead. Okay? Is that cool? Now listen to what it says next. And you are full in him. If you're trying to be complete, if you're trying to have fullness outside of Him, you'll never have it. If you're trying to get Him to drop it from heaven on you, you'll never get it. 
it's not going to happen. There's only one way. You must change your view of you. You must quit being outside of Jesus and trying to get Jesus to relate to you. You must quit trying to seek Jesus outside of being seeking Him in, in the resurrection. You're not seeking Jesus of Nazareth. You're not seeking the Jesus that walked the shores of Galilee. You're seeking the Jesus that's been raised. Or I hope you are. And if you are, then what you're doing is you are not, you are not, you know, if you picture Jesus walking the earth, you are not following after Him, trying to catch Him in the right mood to give you the things that you need to overcome. Now that's, that's the way they did it. Here's the same principle, but we've spiritualized it. Now He's in heaven, and we're down here, and I pray, and I'm asking Him to give... I'm in the same boat. Does that make sense? I'm, I'm still... The, the cross never happened for me. The resurrection never happened for me. Well, if we're Christians, my brothers and sisters, we, if there's nothing else we understand, we ought to understand the cross and the resurrection. Am I right or wrong? I mean, you know, what are we doing trying to understand all these other subjects when we haven't got that one down? That's the basic gospel right there. And it relates to Christ. And, and it relates to the risen Christ. And it relates to us raised up in Him, joined heirs so that any inheritance, anything, any resources that come out of me come because I'm joined to Him. And that that's the only place I look. I have resources in myself. I do not want to rely on my resources. I continually give up my resources. And at first, uh, I, I often tell people, I don't always know what's Jesus, but I know what's me. You know, I mean... And, and while I can't always make Jesus come forth in a situation, I can stop me from coming forth. Can I get amen from somebody? My God, that's, that's surely goodness and mercy will follow us. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, I know this, this reaction I'm having right now is in Jesus, so I don't need to be, if I believe that I'm in Him, then why, as though living in the world, Am I responding with things that I know are dead? And I'll tell you another thing. If I do respond with something that just pops out of me, I can immediately turn around and say, you know what? That's not Jesus. That's, I'm crucified to that. And I repent not just of wrongdoing, but of the appearance of an old creation in a new creation atmosphere. Can't we do that? Yes. Would not just even the encroachment of the new creation that far make a difference in this world? In this world. <laughs> in the world in which we live. See? So, my completion. There's no such thing. He's complete. And I'm complete in Him. My fullness. There's no such thing. He's my fullness. He's the fullness, and He's my fullness. And out of Him flows this into me. So when I have needs, where do I look? To the faraway God? Or to the living well that I am in and is in me? And I say, when I say not my will, but thine be done, I mean none of me. I believe into you, Jesus. Some of us may not be there yet, but we need to, we need to listen to this, and then we need to get on a, a very sincere search to say, God, that simple phrase that is used that all of us thought we understood when we first got saved, believe in Jesus, I have not even laid hold of the simplicity of believing in Jesus. I'm still believing about Him, not into Him. 
All right, so all that all of his fullness is true of us if we abide. Okay, what is abide? If I am believing into, if I am understanding that the source of this is going to come by being a joined heir. I inherit these traits of lamb nature. I inherit these traits of the Spirit of Christ. I inherit these traits of love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness. I inherit these things, but only by being joined. And you must believe before you see. Jesus said, I told you if you'd believe, you would see. But have we believed that yet? Have we waited on the Lord? Have we believed and waited? You know, faith and patience are used constantly together in the Scriptures. I don't know if you know that or not, but if you didn't know it, you know it now, and I just told you. Faith and patience are used constantly together in the Scriptures. Well, what does that mean? That means that you believe and you wait. Believing doesn't mean that everything pops out. It means you're believing something that is true here in Christ that is true of you now, though you don't manifest it. I wait for the manifestation of the fruit. I abide in the vine. And I believe that I will inherit all the traits of the true vine. Amen? Don't let things rob you of your faith. Listen to me. The devil, the circumstances, the carnal mind, things are always trying to get you to rob, to rob you of your faith in this tremendous resource because if you lose that, then you're just you. And if you're that, what does that mean? You are outside the flock in that you are a little lamb separated out there. No wonder you feel the way you feel. I understand. He understands. But the good shepherd doesn't want to go out there, pick you up, stroke you, and tell you it's going to be all right out there. He's going to do the first thing he's going to do is talk to you and bring you back into the fold, back in Christ, back into the truth, back into right relating. Is that right or wrong? Back into right relating. He's going to do one thing. He's going to try to get you back to abiding in Him. And, he, and if He can get you started there in faith, then He's going to come in by the Holy Spirit and try to bolster you to be patient under the coming of the Lord. For the farmer who hath put the seed into the ground and already knows the harvest is coming hath long patience until he received the early and the latter rain. That's a little extra, but that's basically a quote out of James 5, I think it is. For the, the farmer doesn't just plant a seed and go, oh my God, where is it? Where's the big harvest? Where's the inheritance? Where's the fruit? Where's the beef? Sorry. Where's the results? I love the term, he hath long patience. Has the Spirit of God been dealing with anybody about long suffering? Long patience. Long wait on the Lord. But never just wait, trust. Never just trust, wait. This is from the Lord. This is from the Spirit of God knowing right what, where you are and what you need to hear. Praise God. Hallelujah. So if there is a lack, because you know we're complete in Him. But remember now, okay, come on. This is me over here. I'm never complete. There is no completion. I'm not complete outside of Him. But in Him, I'm complete because He is the completion. I'm full or I have available all fullness because He's the fullness and I'm joined. Do you, do you, are you linking this? The reason why you're complete isn't a magical work done 2,000 years ago. Listen to me, it's not. It's because you are joined in Him now and your completion is the fullness of Christ that is available, not necessarily manifested. 
but is available to which you will avail yourself from faith to faith, strength to strength. It is only true, not just because when you were born again you were placed in Christ for 2,000 years, but because you are complete in Him who is the completion. And you're joined there, waiting on the Lord to bring that forth. So, the only real lack that we have, two things. If we do not see our lack and our barrenness and our hopelessness, then we will resort to what we call strength and He calls weakness. What we call, what He calls filthy rags, we call righteousness. Hello? This is a contrast where we must be brought out of our resources, out of our old way, and into Jesus in such a manner that we believe that you're not going to believe that. You're not going to even want that until you've given up on yourself. Somebody who thinks he deserves to inherit something will never become a true heir. Isn't that amazing? That's just amazing. It's like, you know, and I, I hate to use this one, but I, rem I used it, I mean, I've said it. You know, but, I mean, when I first got born again, I remember very humbly and being deeply affected what is it that God saw in me that He saved me? And I meant that. I just thought, you know, it just gave me self-esteem that I never had before, which is really pitiful because the Scriptures are not meant to be giving me self-esteem, but to put me to death so that Christ can be all the esteem that I ever need. What did God see in me? Well, when He looked in you, He saw something worthy of death. He saw filthy rags. He saw corruption. And He said, Randy, if I don't kill you, you're going to bring forth more corruption. So He took me to the cross. He says, here's what I see in you, corruption. Here's what I have for you, death. And then in resurrection, it will be Christ, not you, not you special. You know what, folks, people of my background and of, you know, you can go through some real junk where you always doubt yourself. You always have a, you know, you never get over yourself. This is the way to get over yourself. This is. Because all of a sudden you're going, you know, this is good. You must, you'll never receive His completion until you see your barrenness. And then you'll start looking to His resources as your inheritance. Because it must come forth out of you. You're joined. Here is my inheritance. Here it comes. Get out of the way. Here comes the lamb. Get out of the way. Here comes patience. Wow. Praise God. Amen is right. All right. So we know that the scriptures in Ephesians, the first chapter, all through that chapter. You know, we're accepted in the Beloved. We're predestinated in Christ. We're all the Scriptures, you know, forgiveness of sins in Him, uh, um, through the blood, all these things mention about being in Christ. This means that independent branches have no acceptability except as they are one, as they're joined in Christ. I'm accepted Okay, listen. When it says I'm accepted in the Beloved, it's saying this. I'm accepted as, as I am joined in the Beloved. I'm accepted because I'm going to be bringing forth the Beloved. Now, you're accepted because you are totally seen as one. You are joined. The truth is you're joined but it does require faith. This does not operate. And I told you in the last session, I'm telling you again, Galatians deals with this, that the, that the door of faith must be opened for this to apply. 
And I don't know, I mean, maybe I'll get into it just in a little bit, but maybe not. So it's not based on your fitness, it's not based on your acceptability. I've got a good scripture for you here. You tell me uh, what this scripture means. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Second Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 19 and 20. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, let's see, let me, yeah, yes, even by me and Silvanus and Timothy, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him amen, under the glory of God by us. Have you ever read those scriptures and thought, what the heck does that mean? Anybody ever, you know, and going, no, it's not, yeah, 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 all the promises. You know, I remember, I, there's songs out there talking about, you know, all the promises of God are yay and amen. Well, I want you to know that all the promises of God are not yay and amen. It doesn't say that. It says, the last part of 19 was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. For all the promises of God in him are yea and in him. Amen. Notice three times in those two verses it keeps saying in him, under the glory of God by us. There, all the promises of God are yea and they are amen. What is the meaning of that? It is sure in Christ. All of, the, all of the inheritance, all that you inherit is sure in Him. There, when He says it, it's true in Christ and it'll work in Christ. When He says it, if you take it out of Christ and you put yourself out here somewhere and you try to make all the promises of God valid to you as the inheritor, you are a violator. But I got good news. In Him, they're sure. They're, uh, they're all yea and amen. I mean, He doesn't go back on any of them. He will not go back. He will not withhold any of these things from anybody. Anybody in Him. Why? Because anybody in Him is partaking of Him. Because anybody in Him has the same rights as anybody else. Because you're a joined heir. You're not, you're not Randy or Sarah or Nisi or Amber or Carolyn. You're, that's not who you are. You are officially in God's mind. Who are you? You are a joined heir. That's who you are. And He doesn't, he doesn't look at you and start weighing you. Are you listening? He doesn't question you. You question you. But here's why. You're questioning this one out here. You're not out there. You haven't been out there since Calvary. You are not out there. Some of you act like you're really out there. But that's not what I'm talking about. In Christ... You are joined right here, and that's where you've been, and all that it requires is faith. Faith is the key. It's not a work. It's a belief into Him. You see what I'm saying? Faith isn't something you do. It's something you believe about what He's done. It's not something you do. It's what you believe about what He's done. He's crucified the old, and you are now in Him, and that's what you believe. And so the promise is to you, yay, amen. I mean, it's, well, I don't see it in you yet, brother. Praise God, it's a promise. God cannot lie. He will bring forth his seed. I am abiding in the land, and the seed's going to come out of me. He can't, he can't lie. And it's sure, it is as sure as the core of God. It is not based on me. It is not based on my evaluation of myself outside of Him. 
Does anybody see why we must preach this gospel and why you must receive the gospel preached? Both are true. You must receive. When do you receive this? When you're doing good? No, at all times. I, I love David. I, at all times I will bless thee. You know? Not when it feels good or, you know, but at all times because at all times I am a joined heir and that's just settled. That's just settled. And that has nothing, I, I keep saying this, but I just want to drive it home. It has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with your failures. It has nothing to do... Okay, listen, let me try to hit this another way. And I don't know what time we started, so you're going to have to tell me if we got to... Okay, so... It, it, okay, here, here we have a person. Let's call this you, outside of Christ. Okay, here we have another person. And here we have another one. You start measuring yourself here going, well look, they have more than I have. They're better than I have. They're more spiritual or they're more loved or they're more... Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Paul said you are not wise to compare yourselves in this realm. Why? Because you're not in that realm. You have been delivered from the power of darkness and translated it into the kingdom of His dear Son. And in here, there's neither Greek, Jew, bond free. Well, what does that mean? Am I not a man? I think Paul even said that, you know? <laughs> you know? Well, yes, I am. I, I can't help that. I always will be in the way that I carry myself and whatever. But not here. Not when it comes to resources, not when it comes to inheritance, not when it comes to fruit, not when it comes to patience, not when it comes to meekness or gentleness. No, here everyone is just plugged into the true vine and can draw equally. Do all draw equally? No. Everyone has different stages in which they came, different amount of years. Some have been a long time and have a very small drawing. Some have been a very short time, but they're learning quickly and they're drawing from this. But all, all that they are doing is drawing from the yea and the amen. Praise. All that you will ever do is draw, and that will mean you'll have to take your eyes off of this that, that is outside of Christ. You'll have to quit viewing that person comparing it to you. You'll have to start viewing yourself totally in Christ and in there there is not that person as you know it. In other words, there's not Amber, there's a joined heir. And everyone in this room, everyone watching this or listening to it, is nothing but a joined heir. It's not based on your sex, it's not based on your background, it's not based on your culture. It's based on one thing, will I abide in Christ? And if I say yay, then he says, amen. Amen. <laughs> Is that right or wrong? Okay. Well, what has to, what has to happen to, to, to break forth with rivers? What has to happen? Well, it's very simple. You have to start acting like a joined heir, not outside of here, but in here. Live in Christ, not outside of Christ trying to get Him to bless you. Is this making sense? I mean, there must be a break with the old. Old things must pass away, but they only pass away when you're in Christ and find a new way. He is the way. A new truth. He is the truth. Outside of Him, He might show you the way. Outside of Him being in Him, He might show you the truth. But I got news for you. In Him, He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. And He is your resources on all of these fronts. And the fulfillment of the Scripture will take place. Out of you will flow. Will? Shall flow. Shall? What is this shall? Well, what if I'm, anybody ever thought, well, you know, I just keep messing up or I'm no good or there must be something wrong with me. Anybody ever thought like that? I want you to come up here. I'm going to slap you, every one of you in the face. I'm sorry, we need to cut that. But, you know, my point being, 
we must abide in Christ. Amen? We must see ourselves at all times here in Christ. And as we do that, there will be no comparisons. You'll just, if you see resources coming out of somebody, you will say, thank God they started doing this long before I did. Abiding. <laughs> Amen? Abiding. That's all they did. It's not yay and nay. It's not maybe. It's not yay and maybe. It's not could be. You know, we say, do you believe in the Lord? Absolutely, maybe. Positively, could be. You know, no, I believe into Him and therefore all that is there is yea and amen as far as I'm concerned and as far as my life is concerned. They're sure in Christ. Let me uh, look at one more scripture, Galatians chapter 4. And let me say while I'm turning there that... When he's talking about this, all the promises of God in him, or yea and amen, the emphasis is that he's not trying to get you, listen carefully, he's not trying to get you to accept the promises of God. He's trying, he's trying to get you established in Christ. Do I not see the value of the promises of God? Do I not see the value of a fruitful life? Do I not see the value of, of the inheritance? Yes, I do. Then why don't you preach those things more? Because in my mind, those things are automatics of believing into. You get in Him, you get established in Him, they will come. But why on earth would I want to spend my time preaching to you something that will never happen and not show you the source, not show you the fountainhead, not, you know, why would I preach for you to bring forth the fruit of the Spirit and not give you the Spirit? You see, I say first things first. You'll hear some of the most jubilant preaching with all of the trimmings once everybody in this place is walking in Christ firmly established, then I'll get into, you know, some good time baby stuff, okay? <laughs> but in the meantime, if there's one sheep lagging behind, I will not leave them behind until we all are established in the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's what the Bible says. Alright, so Galatians 4 uh, verse 1. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. Notice that it is saying the heir. But it is saying that you can be an heir and be lacking. Is that right or wrong? It's absolutely saying that. There's just no question. You can be an heir and yet not how, how can I say this? You can be an heir and not inherit. Okay? Alright, verse 7. Oh, 6 and 7. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more servant but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. A couple of things here. If a son, then an heir. Okay. Verse 1, now I say that the heir, though he's, uh, you know, as long as he's a child, it's, and the word child here isn't talking about years in salvation. It's talking about a certain relationship with the Father. That relationship is in Son. You don't have a relationship with the Father outside of the risen Son that you are in. Okay? One who lives outside of union is a child. One who lives outside of union relates as a child. As one who is yet immature. 
God's, first of all, the work of Jesus on the cross and in resurrection has brought you in Christ. But though you are in the family, though you're an heir, you are acting like you're not in Christ. You're acting like you're not, let me say it different because we get stumbled on it. You're acting like you're not a joined heir. You're still trying to get something from through separateness by praying it in or, or being better or doing something, you know, doing something. So, what is the answer to that? And verse 7 gives it, thou art, Wherefore thou art no more servant but a son, and if a son, then an heir. A son is one who has, and, and the word um, uh, son is the word uh, huios. And the literal word means son placing. It is talking about being joined in and taking your place as a son. Where is your place as a son? I, if I'm not mistaken, the word adoption, is that the word that means son placing? I can't remember. I think it is. Adoption means son placing. It, it doesn't mean taking somebody outside the family and bringing them in. It means taking somebody outside of Christ and bringing them in to relate by Christ. Did you hear what I said? I'm telling you, because you're, you're already a child. This scripture says that it is children that are adopted as sons, not outside people. Those that are in the family. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, different than from a servant, though he's Lord of all, you're already that. But you're not relating as that. Okay? So, if a son, and that's the key, if, if, if a son, then an heir. The son is this son, the risen son, and it proves that by the next phrase, if a son, then an heir of God, through Jesus Christ. You are an heir of God through, and the word through means through the instrumentality of Him. He is the vehicle. He is the, the one through whom these things are made possible. If you are not joined to Him, these things are not possible. Alright, so, just in closing, you are born again and you enter as a child of God. Everyone who is born again is in the family. But not everyone who is in the family acts like the Father or acts like the Lamb. Am I right or wrong? Amen. If you don't believe that, just go visit a few churches and I'll see you in a couple of weeks. You don't need to go that far. Just spend some time with one another. Anyway, just talk among yourselves and you'll find out. <laughs> So, you are in the family, but you are not like the family. Has anybody seen within yourself that you're not like the Father? You don't have the family spirit of the Father and of the Son. And so, the process is to take you, is to adopt you. And adoption is a literal process in the Scripture for Christians for saved ones, for those who are already Lord of all but not acting like Him. And to place them, it is a son placing, to place them in Christ where they relate as an heir of God through Christ. And if a son in the son... I'm a son of God, but only by Christ. You, you take the reality of me being joined in Him and Him living in me, and I'm a child. I relate as a child. I act like a child. I play with childish things. And you will. You'll play with every little thing out here. You'll try to get hold of every, the next wave. You'll get after all these things. But when you start entering into this reality 
and start living as a joined heir, then you put away childish things and you start seeking the Lord and you start desiring more of the Lord and you do that first, first, not by worrying about your life, but first by learning the true meaning, shall I say, of being an heir. The true meaning of what it means to be in Christ. The true meaning of what it means to be a true joined heir. Where you are joined here and you reckon, you reckon on the death. And you, and you claim of yourself, I am the death. He is the resurrection. And there is no hope in me. There is nothing but dryness in me. I will never come to that stature that God wants because the stature is the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. There I must abide and not leave the place of being a son of God by Christ. All right, let's close up. Father, we just thank You for Your Word. And I just pray for hungry hearts, Lord, that want to know You. That you will open, Father, open, open the Word of God, open the heart of the, the Spirit of God, open the heart of the Father, open the heart of the Son, that we may not just follow Him around, but have part with Him. Father, may the words not fall on deaf ears. May they not fall on hard ground. But may we gather in the seeds of these words and hold them as precious until they've germinated within us. Until they bring forth life. Until they bring forth His, his life. Until they bring forth fruit. His fruit in us. Father, we are incapable in ourselves, but we believe into Christ as joined heirs. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. God bless you.